Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live webcast, Developing a Comprehensive Toolkit for Microbial Identification. I'm Rita Peters, Editorial Director of Pharmaceutical Technology and Biopharm International. Today's educational webcast is brought to you by Eurofin's Lancaster Laboratories. As a member of Eurofin's scientific biopharma product testing group, the world's largest network of harmonized biopharmaceutical GMP product testing laboratories worldwide, Eurofin's Lancaster Laboratories provides comprehensive laboratory services for the world's largest pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies. With a global capacity of more than 500,000 square feet, the company's network of 14 GMP laboratories provide analytical testing for nearly all stages of the drug development process and supports all functional areas of biopharmaceutical manufacturing, including analytical development, microbiology, process validation, and quality control. Now for some important announcements. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can following the presentations. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon at the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I'm pleased to be joined today by Christopher Gilmer, Senior Microbiologist and Group Leader at Eurofin's Lancaster Laboratories, and Dr. Arnaud Carlotti, President of Eurofin's ID Mike. Leading off today's presentation is Christopher Gilmer. As a Senior Microbiologist for Eurofin's Lancaster Laboratories, he brings more than a decade of experience to his role as Group Leader of Organism Identifications. He serves as a quality systems administrator within the department and contributes to various projects through training, method development, and technical writing. Mr. Gilmer earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Kutztown University. He holds a certification in the American Society of Microbiology's National Registry of Certified Microbiologists. Our second presenter is Dr. Arno Carlotti, PhD. As the founder and president of Eurofin's ID Mic, Dr. Carlotti manages the detection, identification, and typing of microorganisms using molecular methods for clients in the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries. With 25 years of microbial identification experience, Dr. Carlotti has been involved in the identification of multiple new bacteria species and has secured multiple patents for detection, identification, and typing of microorganisms by molecular methods. He earned a doctorate from the University of Lyon, France, a Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology and Genetics from the University of Clermont-Ferrand, and he's published more than 30 papers and peer-reviewed scientific publications. Chris, please get us started. Thank you, Rita. <clears throat> I'd like to share just a little more information about us as we get started. Uh, Eurofin's Lancaster Laboratories, located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is a premier provider of contract laboratory services in the biopharmaceutical industry and offers dedicated microbial identification services supporting our microbiological testing groups and direct submission projects. Eurofin's IDMIC, located in Lyon, France, is a global leader in standard and specialized microbial identification services. They have developed a private database of nearly 8,500 bacterial gene sequences validated against type strains and have extensive experience in species characterization through gene sequencing and molecular biology services. We have an ongoing collaborative effort between the laboratories to establish a standard global platform for microbial identification services across the entire Eurofins network. This process has brought our experts together in discussing the current state of the art of microbial identification services 
including my microbial classifications, identification methods, specialized typing techniques, and comprehensive databases. And we'll be sharing this discussion with you today. During this presentation, we'll review uh, bacterial taxonomy and classification, current identification methods available and their applications, specialized identification approaches involving gene sequencing and typing techniques, and the value of developing and maintaining a comprehensive date reference database. Over the past 10 years, the use of molecular methods has led to tremendous modifications in quality control and quality assurance, including a number of applications uh, in the microbiology laboratory. These include the detection of microorganisms, species level identifications of organisms, uh, typing of isolates, uh, where we're inferring infraspecies genetic diversity, uh, as well as quantification of microorganisms. And today we'll focus on identification and typing. We'll consider the taxonomic resolution of various molecular methods, the definition of bacterial species, the molecular criteria for organism discrimination, including DNA-DNA hybridization, 16S rRNA gene sequencing, and multi-locus sequence analysis, and finally applications to typing isolates of a species. This graphic, adapted from Berge's manual, second edition, uh, compares the taxonomic resolution of various analyses. You can see a number of techniques in green, uh, at the top, specifically useful in typing applications. We'll further discuss DNA amplification methods and provide an example of their use in a case study. The evaluation of whole cell proteins for infraspecies discrimination has led to the development of MALDI-TOF uh, phenotypic identification systems. The phenotypic techniques also in green, a little bit lower on the chart, uh, are a broad category that can contribute a variety of information used in organism discrimination. Dr. Carlotti will describe DNA-DNA hybridization, uh, shown here in orange, and its use in determining highly reliable uh, species comparisons. And finally, we'll focus on DNA sequencing applications, including 16S rRNA sequencing, shown in blue, uh, for standard identification down to the species level, and multi-locus sequence analysis and typing, uh, shown in purple, which provide enhanced resolution at and beyond the species level. Amplification methods commonly used include polymerase chain reaction, PCR, uh, for detection and identification, and random amplified polymorphic DNA, RAPD, uh, and variable number of tandem repeats uh, for typing. Uh, Dr. Carlotti and I will further describe the use of RAPD and microsatellites, a type of, of short tandem repeats in typing section. There are a variety of sequence-based methods and techniques available, but we will focus on 16S gene sequencing and multi-locus sequence analysis for identifications, as well as introduce multi-locus sequence typing. We'd like to begin with an introduction to MALDI-TOF uh, emerging as a valuable phenotypic in identification option within the biopharmaceutical wow. industry. We commonly receive quest, requests to provide more information about the science, the system, and the application to IDs. Uh, bef before I move on, I'd like to pause for a minute and allow Rita to share our first polling question with you. All right, thank you, Chris. So uh, I invite the audience to participate in this polling question. And you can participate just by clicking your answer directly on the screen and hitting submit. So the question is, what identification methods have you utilized for investigations at your company? 16S gene sequencing, multi-locus multi sequencing analysis, multi-TOF, or biochemical methods? So again, the question is, what identification methods have you utilized for investigations at your company? 16S gene sequencing, multi-locus sequencing analysis, multi-TOF, or biochemical methods? So let's uh, submit your answer. And now let's take a look at the results. Uh, so it looks like biochemical method seems to be uh, the most uh, predominant method. 
So let me turn it back over to the presenters and we can learn some more. Okay, thank you, Rita. Thank you for everyone for your contributions there. It's nice to see uh, where all the experience is coming from in our audience. <coughs> Um, so moving on to the principles of Maldi Talk, I'd like to, to introduce this to everyone, and, and I know that this is something that is um, really new to, to a lot of the people um, w that are working with microbial applications and, and, and looking at organism identification solutions. Uh, organisms express unique protein patterns based on their genetic makeup. Understandably, these organisms that are most closely related to one another generate protein spectra with relative uh, similarity. The analysis uses matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spectrometry to determine these protein patterns. It's really a mouthful, but I'll go on to the next slide and present the components of this technology with the help of visual aid. The very simple processing steps involve depositing an isolate onto a stainless steel target plate and overlaying with an acid solution. Uh, this is referred to as the matrix. Uh, this releases and stabilizes the proteins for analysis. Within the instrument, each individual sample preparation is analyzed by firing a focused laser beam at the spot. The matrix absorbs the laser energy and ionizes the proteins, which are accelerated through a high vacuum tube uh, to a detector at the end. The protein sizes are determined by differences in the time of flight, and protein abundance is measured by the intensity. The protein analysis from laser to detector occurs instantaneously, and hundreds of laser shots are collected in about 10 seconds. Uh, a typical analysis collects 600 to 1,200 shots uh, to create a rich um, sample spectrum. The entire process is fully automated, and operators can monitor the data acquisition real time. Here's a graphic of the bench level and instrument level functions. Uh, a freshly cultured colony is harvested and applied to the target plate where the matrix is overlaid and allowed to dry. The plate is loaded into the instrument where the laser uh, ionizes the protein mixture. And you can see uh, they are accelerated through uh, electrodes and down the time of flight tube where they separate based on size, the larger particles traveling slower. The differences in travel time and abundance are measured at the detector. So here is a standard mass spectrum illustrating numerous peaks across the standard protein size range uh, and corresponding abundance represented by peak intensity. As I mentioned, the data acquisition is fully automated by the instrument software, uh, and this raw data is directly evaluated by the identification software. I'd like to note that while numerous peaks in a spectrum like this are obvious to the user, we can see um, very clearly where they are. Uh, the, uh, the system software typically identifies 90 or more significant peaks for, for evaluation. And this is uh, an important point to keep in mind as we discuss the organism identification process. Uh, at Lancaster Labs, we utilize a broker biotyper system, and so some of the examples may be specific to the manufacturer. However, the fundamental process of organism ID by Maldetoff is otherwise consistent among commercially, commercially available systems. The identification software compares the isolate spectrum of, uh, to those of a reference database, where correlations between the peak matches, peak intensities, and overall fit of peak positions uh, are used to generate a match score. Due to the number of peaks in a spectrum and the variety of significant to subtle differences, these few general criteria result in reliable discrimination between matched organisms. The Broker Biotyper system utilizes log-adjusted score criteria ranging from 0 to 3 to determine a level of confidence or probability that the sample isolate is a representative of the match, either species level, genus level, or not probable. Here's a standard classification report of an environmental isolate illustrating a species level match to Sphingomonas melanus with a score of 2.147, as shown in green. 
uh, falling within the range of 2.0 to 3.0 for species. The second and third matches of Sphingomonas aquatilis fall within the range of 1.7 to 1.999 uh, for genus level consistency, and all remaining matches are well below this threshold. Further evaluation of the match list is highly recommended uh, rather than just taking the top best match. Uh, analysis of true unknown isolates illustrates the influence of strain differences, closely related organism groups, and sample preparation. Phenotypes of strains isolated from various environmental sources uh, can significantly differ from type strain references that were, are generated under optimal culturing conditions. Some organism groups understandably may generate highly similar protein profiles uh, based on their genetic similarity. And additional culturing and preparation techniques may be necessary or useful for certain organism or cell types. For example, there's an ethanol formic acid extraction that is commonly used for gram-positive bacteria and yeasts due to their cell wall composition. And broth culturing may overcome some difficulties in harvesting dry or filamentous colonies from solid agar media. Final result interpretation is best performed by analysts experienced in raw data acquisition as well as microbial taxonomy and classifications. Uh, Real-time observations of raw data collection uh, can indicate if the sample preparation was appropriate for the isolate. Use of manufacturer thresholds with more stringent interpretation guidelines uh, may be appropriate to provide results that accurately reflect the confident, confidence level of the analysis performed. Uh, users should be cautious of reports on reducing score thresholds for acceptable identifications, for example, using uh, 1.7 as a threshold for species level confidence. Um, these reduced thresholds rely on optimal sample preparation required for each particular isolate and databases with extremely broad coverage of spectral variations that can be encountered for environmental isolates. Organism identification by MALDITOF offers a significant reduction in processing time and costs over alternative ID methods. A user can process and interpret approximately 100 samples in about three hours uh, with limited consumption of reagents and materials. This is extremely valuable in providing same-day expedited processing, uh, which we see more and more often um, in our direct submissions. The whole cell analysis provides a useful alternative to supplement or supplemental test to, to uh, standard sequencing. Um, some organisms may routinely generate <clears throat> low quality gene sequencing results, uh, which we've experienced with some carinibacterium isolates, for example, uh, but are easily and successfully analyzed with standard MALDI-TOF techniques. Um, the, uh, some closely related Species may also show significantly different phenotypes due to protein expression of genes outside of their standard sequencing regions. So I'd like to return to our earlier example of uh, Sphingomonas. Uh, you can see uh, the top two species indicated <clears throat> on this report are not well discriminated by uh, 16S gene sequencing. Um, that's Sphingomonas melanus and aquatilus. In fact, our experience has often been to see isolates with identical uh, results of 100% similarity to these two species. Uh, for, for common environmental isolates, the user may find some increased species discrimination through this cost-effective testing to be a valuable tool in their microbial identification approach. Uh, another common question that we get um, in regards, is in regards to industry acceptance and qualification of a system. Uh, the USP General Chapter uh, 1113 recognizes MALDITOF as a suitable phenotypic approach in microbial characterization. This guidance provides a description of some limitations that were identified in early development of the technology, including culturing media and conditions. However, manufacturers have developed systems and methods that minimize these influences, and experienced operators can apply appropriate techniques for efficient and successful analysis. Qualification recommendations are also outlined in this USB chapter, uh, and such efforts may include evaluation of routinely encountered operating conditions 
to ensure performance of a robust system. This may involve culturing organisms on various media, under various incubating and storage conditions, and incorporating variability of operator techniques. Phenotypic methods include MALDI-TOF, uh, including MALDI-TOF provides sufficient information to, to, to make informed decisions, and our clients are choosing this option for environmental monitoring, indicator organism screenings, and known culture confirmations. Brooker Biotyper database contains more than 4,600 validated microorganism spectra. Uh, current literature and our experience has shown the value of database expansion, another topic addressed in USB Chapter 1113. Uh, users may find it necessary to supplement the database with missing species that are routinely encountered uh, in their operations or unique strains from, from specific environmental sources. There's currently no useful public reference database available, uh, but methods are available for proper creation of reference spectra. This may be performed using purchased type strains from a collection or isolates that have been validated against a comprehensive sequencing database, along with some of the considerations that will be discussed in the next section. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Carlotti to continue with our discussion of organism classifications and sequencing methodology. Okay, thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. We will now talk about molecular identification of bacteria and look at the, the principle of uh, classification as seen in the Berges uh, second edition. Now, classification of uh, bacteria is based on the polyphasic criteria. Those criteria include molecular criteria, phenotypical criteria, and chemical criteria. For molecular criteria, DNA-DNA hybridization and 16S RNA gene sequencing are uh, of value as well as the multilocus sequence analysis that is more and more used in, uh, to replace DNA-DNA homology. Phenotypical criteria like morphology, protein content, biochemical characteristics, physiological traits are of uh, very big importance in uh, providing simple tests to discriminate in between uh, closed species. And finally, chemical criteria, menaquinone and um, mycolic acids and so on, they are a great value for uh, high-level taxonomic uh, separation like genera or family. Regarding DNA-DNA hybridization, members of the species should have more than 70% of homology in their DNA-DNA hybridization studies, which means that two isolates to belong to the, to the same species much, must have those uh, homology above 70% in their DNA-DNA hybridization. There is some genome length variation that can be seen among members of the same species. This can reach up to 8%. And between species, this can reach up to 60%, 50%, sorry. To describe a new species, there is some special requirements. Even if we have evidence based on DNA-DNA hybridization that two uh, isolate or one isolate belong to something different than what we know, we can't uh, describe a species only based on molecular evidence. As I said before, it's polyphasic criteria that are needed, and they include phenotypical char characteristics for differentiation of closely related species. If we have no uh, phenotypical traits that allow us to discriminate from possible uh, closely related species, we are not uh, allowed to give a name, a new name for the species. It is a putative species. And if it is based only on molecular criteria, we will talk about the genome of species, but we will never be able to put a name for this species uh, as long as we do not have those phenotypical simple criteria uh, to uh, allow their dis distinction from other uh, existing species. And this 
raise the question of what is the type strain of a species, and I will turn to Rita for our next uh, polling question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so let's get the audience involved again. So what is the definition of type strain of a species? So you can make your selection on the screen and hit submit. And your answer options are a subspecies variant of a microorganism, an organism deposited to a, cell, a culture collection, or a fully characterized and published representative. Again, the question, what is the definition of type strain of a species? A subspecies variant of a microorganism, an organism deposited to a culture collection, or a fully characterized and published representative. So let uh, just make your selection and click Submit. All right, now let's take a look at the answers. All right, so it looks like uh, we have a bit of division among the audience. Um, but let me turn it back over to the speakers and we can learn some more. Yes, the, the right answer is C. A type strain is a fully characterized and published representative. It's uh, an isolate that has been selected among those isolates used for the description of the species. And it has been selected as being the most representative based on the information we do have on the uh, three or five isolates used in the publication. And it is uh, considered as the most uh, representative by uh, sh sharing the common characteristic of the isolate of the species. So it's the most representative isolate of the species. Now we will look at the DNA-DNA hybridization. I still not have the slide on the screen. Okay, thank you. DNA-DNA hybridization, we have some advantages for this uh, technique. It is the gold standard for proposed uh, new species. This is a taxonomic reference. And this has uh, been confirmed many times by genomic data. Now that we are able to compare whole genome, genomes of uh, bacteria, we can express the comparison as an average nucleotide identity. And uh, for members of the same species, it is above 95% of average nucleotide identity, and it is less when uh, we compare genome of uh, different species. There are some shortcomings. First of all, it's a time-consuming uh, technique. It's definitely not a rapid method. It's labor-intensive, very expensive, and it's done by expert laboratories only, and mainly those laboratories involved in uh, taxonomic studies. And this is replaced more and more by the multilocus sequence analysis since the results of uh, both methods are congruent in uh, determining if two isolates be belong to the same species. And we will talk about, about MLSA after that. The second molecular criteria that is used is the 16S RNA gene sequencing. This is a phylogenetic marker. It is very useful for discrimination to the rank of genus. And this is the main application in Berger's second edition. For specific definition, 16S is an exclusive criteria, which means that isolates with less than 97% homology with all the, uh, with the known species belong to a different species. And this is well correlated with DNA DNA hybridization for which in this situation we have less than 70% DNA-DNA homology in between the isolate and non-species. 
However, for homologies above 97%, the interpretation of the data is less clear because there is no definite threshold value, for example, 98.5%, about which there is a universal agreement of what constitutes definitive and conclusive identification to the rank of species. Regarding the steps of the analysis for comparative sequencing of 16S gene sequencing, we start from sample obtained as a pure culture on a petri dish. There is a DNA extraction step, then an amplification of the, the gene of interest, in this case the genes encoding 16S RNA, and the complete gene is roughly 1,500 base pair. In some applications, it's only a partial uh, sequencing. It's only 500 base pair of these genes that are amplified and then sequencing. And in other applications, we can use the almost complete gene. So let's go for almost complete gene. We do amplify the 1,500 base pair fragment, purify the amplified the DNA, then we do the sequencing reaction for both strands of the DNA, purification of the sequencing reagent, reaction uh, sample, and then perform the sequencing on a specialized apparatus. And the next step will be the interpretation of the data. So comparative sequencing principle, after amplification of the target DNA, sequencing of the both strands for one and reverse. There is an addition of the raw sequences for correction of error because there is uh, sometimes error generated with the sequencer. That's why it's important to sequence both strands. Then we obtain contigs, consensus sequence that is also edited, and then this consensus sequence is compared to a sequence database. Sequence database can be public or private, and they have their advantages and their shortcomings also. And then we perform molecular taxonomy. We uh, determine uh, what are the reference sequences most closest related to the unknown that we have to identify. We can share this uh, study we did in uh, 2008 of uh, uh, comparative sequencing study regarding uh, 672 isolates from pharma, and it was based on partial sequencing of the five prime, prime end of the gene, which is uh, uh, roughly 500 base per long. We end up with a genus level identification for 629 isolates, which represented 94% of the isolates included in the study. We end up with a good identification at the spacious level for 511 isolates, 76% of the isolates in the study. And we were not able to identify at the spacious level 161 isolates, 24% of the isolates, of which we had a insufficient discrimination for 118 isolates because we end up with more than 97% homology with uh, reference uh, sequencing the, the database, but the number of mismatches between the unknown and the top references were uh, le less than three base pair, which is not significant enough under three, uh, to be sure of the identification. So we have unresolved main species, in general like Acinetobacter, Bacillus, Corinebacterium, and so on. And for, in some cases, we end up also with 100% homologies with more than uh, one reference sequence with 16S. And finally, we had 43 isolates, 6%, for which the percentage of uh, homologies were less than 97%. And this suggested that the detection uh, of these isolates uh, represents yet undescribed species. 
And we had the opportunity to uh, confirm this with the description of Megamonas repellensis. It was one of the isolates that was uh, in the study and for which we completed the description and gave the clue that it was a new species and it was described also in 2008. So we have some consideration to make here that 16S RNA gene sequencing partial uh, is less performant than uh, performing uh, almost complete sequencing of this gene, what we call the taxonomic quality uh, sequencing. And the taxonomic value of 16S RNA sequence relies on near full gene sequence. Uh, this is mandatory for a description of a new species to include the near food gene sequence. It's not enough to include just the pastoral sequence of the 16S RNA gene. And all the statements in taxonomy and phylogeny about the use of 16S rely near full gene sequence, not on partial sequence. So it's very important to keep this in mind. We have the in the literature and in our own experience, evidences that longer sequences uh, allow for better discrimination of closely related species. We have many uh, uh, examples, for example, for example, with Bacillus atrophius, uh, as compared to Valis mortis and Subtilis, uh, and remain member of the Subtilis group, and also in Microbacterium, in Micrococcus, Penibacillus, and Staphylococcus too. And so these are examples of the common species with improved discrimination using long sequencing rather than partial sequencing. Another point to consider is the importance of the reference sequence databases. The larger the database, the better the discrimination. There is relevant entries validated against published type strain sequences that are included in our database. And if we use incomplete database, this can lead to an artificial limitation of the bacterial world to a limited subgroup only. And we will only refer to this subgroup, uh, not taking into account the rest of the bacterial world. And this can lead to no ID at the species level. This is not that bad if ID at the genus level. This can lead to misidentification at the species level, and this is an interpretation error. Ambiguous results also can be uh, obtained for unresolved species, or false discrimination, because we are not taking into account other closest uh, matches that are missing. So it's very important to have a very complete database, uh, up to date, and also it's, this is important to make uh, updates of the database, because new species are described almost every day. You can look at this uh, figure on which we can see that uh, the number in blue, the number of new species described each year have increased uh, drastically in between uh, year 1980 to uh, present time. And now we are roughly in between 500, 800 new species described each year uh, from year 2007. We have developed a comprehensive database that is made up of 16 RNA near food gene sequences as a standard reference. They are all based on double strand sequences and we uh, do our uh, identification using double strand sequence uh, that are systematically verified, edited, and interpreted by qualified experts with CGMP compliant traceability. Type strand sequence are written along with additional sequence of collection strands to evaluate intraspecies variability when it is uh, interesting to do so. And uh, the Eurofins IDMAC a bacteria database contains validated uh, 8,470 uh, species. This is the most comprehensive in the industry. It is based on more than 10 years of development. 
and um, this include more of the of 80% uh, of the distinct species uh, to date. We have a next validated release to to come out that will include more than 9,000 entries, and this will be roughly more than 90% of the described species. So it's almost complete regarding the whole bacterial world. Another criteria is uh, the multi locus sequence analysis. So instead of uh, analyzing only one taxonomic gene, like the 16S RNA uh, encoding gene, we are looking at multiple genes, and those genes are generally housekeeping genes, the genes involved in the primary metabolism that uh, encodes proteins, and for which there could be some mutation that uh, do accumulate over the time, uh, and there is a lesser evolutive pression on these genes than uh, regarding 16S RNA genes. So they can uh, accumulate more differences among time, and this can allow discrimination of isolated trans species which diverge in recent, recent evolutionary past. So this removes the drawbacks of using well-conserved markers that sometimes, as, as we have uh, discussed before, uh, do not show any difference even in between two validly uh, separated species. So this is one of the well-known limitations of 16S, and this is um, well compensated by multi locus sequence analysis. Moreover, this is an alternative to DNA-DNA hybridization because there is a very good correlation with results of DNA-DNA hybridization and results of multi locus sequence analysis. As long as you do include uh, a sufficient number of genes, in between 7 to 12 genes are generally used for performing multi locus sequence analysis. And strains of uh, bacteria assigned to the same species should have similar housekeeping gene sequences. This has been uh, published in many uh, uh, articles. There is a, this is a more powerful uh, uh, way to identify the species level than comparative sequencing of 16 RNA gene only. And one difficult point is that genes with taxonomic value are not always the same according to the different bacterial groups. So there is gene of very good interest for one genus uh, or even for some species that are less efficient for others. And we can uh, do illustrate this with the uh, IDMIC HKG1 uh, for Methylobacteriaceae. So we have done a, a study on uh, type strains of the Methylobacterium genus for all the validly described species at the time. On this slide, you can see the uh, neighbor joining tree of the, the different species based on comparison of the 16S RNA gene complete sequence. In the blue box, you can see species for which we had more than 99% homologies in their 16S RNA gene sequences. In the orange box at uh, the bottom of the slide, you can see also uh, the species Fusilla wense, radiotolerance, and orga organophilum, for which we have very, very close uh, sequences with more than 99% homologies. So in this situation, it's not easy to separate to determine exactly what species is uh, really uh, identified for an unknown. Here you have the same kind of uh, analysis, but using uh, the housekeeping gene one marker alone instead of the 16S. And you can see that for the blue box and the orange box, we end up with uh, similarities less than 97% for the blue box member. So there is a clear cut in between those species, and also less than 99% homologies for the members of the orange box, so for the mesophilicum, radiotolerance, and fujiza wensi. So this illustrates the enhanced discrimination that we can end up with multi-locus sequence analysis 
as compared to 60 nets alone. For molecular identification, as a conclusion, for bacteria, we can say that expertise is required to perform molecular identification of bacteria for proper execution of data interpretation of comparative sequencing. 16S RNA gene sequencing is extremely useful, but limitations are now well documented regarding unresolved species. Use of long sequencing and conferences database further improves performance, but not always. So sometimes it is necessary to be able to uh, use other approach like the MLSA uh, to uh, allow for species level identification when unresolved uh, by 16 years alone and a definitive ID is required. Now we will discuss uh, on uh, molecular typing of bacteria. We are talking about methods for identification at the species level. Now we will talk about methods that uh, will uh, allow us to uh, differentiate strains among the same species. So genotyping method should allow discrimination of genetically unrelated strains of the same species. It is strain comparison. Com this compares sig significance of genetic polymorphisms between isolates to determine level of similarity. And we can go from isolates that are identical, the same strain, to highly related, to moderately related, and to unrelated, different strains. There are three characteristics of genotyping methods that are considered when evaluating their performances. The typing ability of the method, the reproducibility of the method, and the discriminatory power of the method. This is an, an estimation of the ability of the method to discriminate two genetically unrelated isolates taken at random in a population of isolates. And uh, the discriminatory power can be uh, enhanced by using various markers and different markers. And then this is what we call a scheme of typing, a typing scheme, when we use different methods and different markers uh, to end up with a, a reliable typing of uh, the microorganisms. Molecular typing of bacteria requires careful application and interpretation. Markers and methods for identification are generally, generally not adapted for typing of isolates because for identification we are looking at the taxonomic level and when we are look, looking for typing isolates, we are looking very, very deeply into the species. So bacterial fingerprint resolution uh, allowed us to uh, see that unrelated isolates generate different patterns. Related isolates generate identical patterns or somewhat similar. And this is best achieved through the use of multiple markers. Amplification methods uh, evaluated, can be evaluated by gel electrophoresis or they can be sequence-based methods for method based on gel electrophoresis, they end up with generating a fingerprint, a profile. The method most frequently used are random amplified polymorphic DNA, amplification at random of polymorphic DNA fragments. The study of variable number tandem repeats containing region of the genome, VNTR, microsatellites, short tandem repeats that uh, also can be uh, can show some variation in their number and in their length and also we can put in this uh, method the rep pcr of repetitive sequences there is uh, the sequence based method for which we have multi locus sequence typing this is the same technology but not the same tar target as, as mlsa and for mlsa we look at housekeeping genes that are of taxonomic interest. For multi locus sequence typing, we look at other housekeeping genes that have evolved very rapidly and that are markers of strains. 
and we can look at single nucleotide polymorphisms by also comparing uh, sequences. On this uh, figure, you can see some fingerprints generated by random amplified polymorphic DNA study for a set of uh, Micrococcus luteus uh, strains that show some very different patterns, but also that show some very uh, closely related patterns, and this is part of an analysis of typing. So for the next uh, polling question, I will turn to uh, Rita to ask this question. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Arno. So here's our next question. So uh, once again, select your answer directly on the screen and click Submit. So what typing techniques have you utilized for investigations at your company? A, ribotyping. B, other, ampli excuse me, other amplification methods such as RAPD or multilocus sequence typing. Once again, what typing techniques have you utilized for investigations at your company? Ribotyping. Other amplification methods such as RAPD or multilocus sequence typing. So you can make your selection and click submit. Now let's push out the answers. So it looks like other amplification methods seems to be uh, the leading area. Um, I'd like to pass it back over to Chris now to wrap up the presentation. Okay, thank you, Rita, and thank you, Arno, for uh, introducing us to uh, the, the typing techniques and, and a little background on the science there. I'd like to step into a molecular typing case study at this time. Uh, <clears throat> within the biopharmaceutical micro uh, department here at Lancaster Labs, we have a sterile products testing group offering sterility testing using isolator technology. And in April of 2014, a positive sterility test result was obtained for a sample. This was a unique therapeutic pro product involving operator manipulation and manual filling under CGMP conditions within the client's production environment. Nonetheless, the positive result detected at Lancaster Labs was extremely rare and alarming occurrence. So identification testing was begun in support of a product-related investigation. The isolate recovered uh, from the sterility positive was identified as Micrococcus luteus uh, by standard sequencing. The client was contacted and indicated to us that an operator who filled the product had growth on an environmental monitoring sample from their gloves. Uh, so the EM isolates were provided to Lancaster Labs and also identified as uh, Micrococcus luteus. A total of 13 Micrococcus luteus isolates were blinded and sent to IDMIC for molecular typing to confirm the source of the contamination. These isolates included those from the sterility positives recovered from both FTM and SCD enrichments, from the client operator glove EM samples, and from laboratory environmental monitoring over the previous six months. Dr. Carlotti and his team evaluated a total of six markers using three different methods uh, and based on the identification of Micrococcus luteus. This included four markers for RAPD analysis, looking for differences in amplified DNA segments, a marker for microsatellite analysis, looking for differences in non-coding base pair repeats, and a marker for unilocus sequence typing. Uh, just to clarify this in relation to the multi-locus sequencing terminology we've discussed, this was a highly variable housekeeping gene for Micrococcus luteus. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, it contributed sufficient differences between the isolates along with the other techniques to thoroughly discriminate at the strain level, uh, enough so that additional markers were not necessary. Uh, we've described the value of housekeeping genes in MLSA for speciation, uh, but here one could be applied uh, to isolate to, uh, but here one could be applied to isolate discrimination within the species uh, itself. This example illustrates the value of expert application of appropriate analyses to the scope of, this, of the particular study. The results of the molecular typing study concluded that the isolates recovered from the sterility positive samples and the client's operator EM gloves, uh, operator glove EM samples were clustered into one related group, cluster number one there. 
the remaining nine isolates showed no significant similarity to the client isolates, nor to one another. This point alone was valuable in illustrating the microbial diversity that can be encountered, but not apparent through standard characterization techniques. The testing provided uh, conclusive details for the root cause investigation performed by Lancaster Labs and allowed the client to conduct appropriate risk assessment of their product and operations. So this presentation has uh, discussed the development of molecular methods as a comprehensive toolkit for various applications in bacterial identification. Comparative sequencing has been optimized through the evaluation of 16S rRNA near full gene sequences and database expansion. And these are the most important aspects of standard sequencing services, services to ensure the most reliable results. MALDITOF is emerging as a valuable option in high throughput and cost-effective identifications. Expert identification at the species level can be obtained by multi-locus sequence analysis when highly reliable identification is required. And we have described various methods for uh, the effective typing uh, of isolates to discriminate at the strain level in support of root cause investigations. I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance today. Uh, please feel free to contact Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories with any general inquiries. And Dr. Carlotti and I will also be happy to receive any direct requests for additional technical information. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask Rita to continue with the QA portion of this event. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'd like to thank both the speakers for their presentations, and we are ready to start our Q&A. So as a reminder to the audience on how to submit questions, you can submit them by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So here's the first one. Uh, this one's for Chris. Um, what type of identification is the micro-seq uh, seq analysis? Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, the microseq analysis uh, as performed by, um, according to the, the microseq, um, the microseq manufactured um, protocol uh, is primarily a fast 500 base pair sequence analysis. Uh, it does a double-stranded DNA evaluation, um, looking at the first 500 base pairs of of the 16S RNA gene, gene sequence. Uh, this is um, a fairly cost-effective approach in, in uh, relation to the microseq um, full gene sequence or, or, or near full gene uh, sequence. Uh, so this is primarily, um, in our, it's our understanding uh, that, that this is primarily the uh, method of choice when you're using a microseq system. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go on to the next question, just want to let um, the audience participants know that if they're interested in receiving a copy of the slides, they can just submit their email address and their request into the uh, question Q&A box. All right, um, and wh while you're doing that, let's move on to the next question. This one's for Dr. Carlotti. Can your uh, ID system identify bacillus anthritis? Um, is it in your uh, system database? Yes, it's uh, very difficult to identify uh, this species as compared to Bacillus cereus group using only 16S. So uh, by using multi-locus sequence analysis, we can uh, discriminate reliably this uh, species, Anthracis, uh, as compared to the other member of the Bacillus cereus group. So the, the answer is yes, by using multi-locus sequence analysis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, back to you. Are there, dat are there databases for a moldy tough like there are for lipids? Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not familiar with, um, with the lipid database, um, so the scope of the question is maybe a little bit um, outside of my experience here. Um, what I can tell you is in reference to our experience with the Brooker system. Uh, that uh, there is a broker validated database that's provided with the system. Um, they also perform uh, routine validation and updates of, of new entries and release new versions of that database. And as I mentioned, uh, users have the opportunity to also um, create their own 
uh, database entries through vendor provided um, instructions. And uh, we here at Lancaster Labs have have a uh, quality SOP that allows for us to 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 uh, perform that uh, um, using internal in-house isolates. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned in early earlier in the discussion, um, there are no, as far as I'm aware, public databases available for for um, you know searches of information that's been gathered by other. Uh, other sources um, working with the Multitoff technology for bacterial identification. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Carlotti, how fast is MLSA? Well, uh, with the current uh, technology of sequencing, MLSA is almost as rapid as a 16S, but we have today in, at the same time three or two or three genes uh, in addition to 16S. So generally we can end up with the results if it is urgent in 12 to 24 hours or if it's a standard in three to five days. Thank you. All right, here's another question for you. What are the most analyzed housekeeping genes? When? The housekeeping genes are of interest for identification at, at the spacious level, as I said earlier, are different according to the genera and so on. So we can um, talk about uh, the RNA polymerase subunit B, what we call RPOB gene, that is very useful for many genera and uh, species in uh, gram-positive bacteria. There, there is also the subunit B of the GRAS gene, the gene involved in the processing of the DNA for application, that is of uh, good interest, and uh, a good example for gram-negative bacteria, for which we end up with a clear discrimination with, when using this one. There is then some other genes like uh, LECA gene, RECA gene, and, and so on. So, I would say that these three are some of the most common genes of interest for MLSA, but there is, there is roughly 12 genes of interest for performing MLSA. All right, thank you. We have another question for you. How discriminating is 16S NNA sequencing for lactobacillus? Well, the, um, for lactobacillus, I would say that 16S is not the best choice for discrimination of species. We have some good examples of uh, lactobacillus pantosus, plantarum, paraplantarum. Those three species, while they are valid, uh, validly described species, are not uh, resolved by using 16S, even by using the long sequence uh, of the 16S. There is also uh, another example, if I remember well, for Lactobacillus casei, ZAE, and Paracasei. In this case also, the three species are not resolved at all by using 16S alone, but by using MLSA, we uh, get very good uh, results for discrimination and better resolution of these species. So I have no other example in mind for Lactobacillus, but effectively this is not the genus for which we end up with the best results using only 16 of RNA uh, for identification. Thank you, Chris. Can you perform microbial identification of a sample that has not yet been plated, such as a raw uh, WFI sample? Um, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on uh, the specific example of, of, of a of what the material type is and what the suspected bio burden might be in there. Um, for something like a water sample, um, I think that you run into an issue of detection limit. Um, I would consider that it would be unlikely that you would, we, you would not want to look at this as a, an option for rapid screening of, de of detection, but rather as of identification of known, known presence of, of bio burden. So I have to imagine that, that a water sample would just not have 
the type of bio burden um, and purity that would be required for direct processing through, say, um, centrifuging a volume to develop a pellet. Uh, essentially, we need the amount of cells that would be seen on a, a, on a, a culturing plate um, enough to generate a colony, maybe 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 cells. Um, so, but in the event that um, we would be processing, for example, a broth that was um, known to be known to have a high level of bio burden in it and, and had a presumption of purity, um, we could process that broth directly. And uh, sometimes, as I mentioned, um, augering, uh, culturing on auger media is not always the best for a particular organism type. And so sometimes uh, culturing in broth is, is an option. And then there's just uh, some, some very specific techniques in pelleting and washing the pellet pure of of any growth medium to, to leave behind pure uh, pure cells. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Colardi, um, if any isolate is not identified, what does this mean? Can the microorganism be considered to be from a newer genera? Yes, so first, if we have compared to the sequence, the reference sequence of all validly described species, for example, with 16S. And if we have not found uh, significant homology with those already known species, the hypothesis that we are in front of a new uh, yet undescribed species, a member of a new yet undescribed species, uh, can be um, raised as a possibility. So it can be a new species, it can be a new genera. If you look at the slide on the number of new species and new genera described a year, you can see that the number of new genera is scarce as compared to the new species. But we will have uh, information by uh, comparing the sequences of, of the 16S, for example, uh, on is it possible that it is a new gene genus or is the unknown isolate close to a already described genus? And then is it a new species? So effectively, uh, we have seen in the study I presented, I shared with the result with uh, the audience, we had 6% of the isolates we faced in this study, 6% corresponded to uh, have no uh, closest related match over 97% uh, for the reference database and also from uh, uh, all the described species at that moment. So effectively, we have uh, made some study here in uh, uh, our ID mic uh, in Lyon to uh, compare and to make some statistics on the number of isolates that uh, for which we had no significant uh, homologies in 16S, almost complete gene, as compared to all the described species. And uh, we uh, end up with up to 10% of the isolates that could be new species. So it's not a rare event in the uh, pharmaceutical industry to face this kind of uh, uh, isolates that correspond to species that have not yet been described and that for some uh, need to uh, or justify to, to make some uh, additional investigation. We will publish for the next year three new species of microbacterium, for example, that we have completely characterized by a genome uh, sequence analysis. We have done the sequencing of the almost complete genome this time, so it's a, a very big work. And we have uh, studied more than 30 uh, housekeeping genes for these uh, putative new species. Mm -hmm. And this is really some isolates that we have uh, received from our clients, performed some identification on it and proved that they corresponded to something new. And we have completed the description and the, uh, uh, the publication now. So uh, effectively, the, we can face isolates that correspond to yet not described species in the current uh, activities in the lab uh, in pharma industries. 
Okay, thank you. We have one final question for you, Dr. Carlotti. Given the availability of this of these new technologies, how reliable would you consider the current chemical ID methods? Okay, chemical, maybe biochemical ID method, I would assume. So it's a very difficult question. I'm not, um, it's not easy to answer to this one very, very rapidly. The techniques, the science do evolve, evaluate over time and improve. And what was good uh, 10 years ago or five years ago is now not that good as compared to, to some new technology to uh, improvement in science. So we can effectively um, guess that some biochemical ID methods uh, are not 100% reliable. It's not difficult to say that. And, now, and then, how down we, we go for the reliability of the method, it's very difficult to, to say. It is clear that some of the bio, biochemical methods in use have proved their efficiency uh, against claimed uh, species regarding their databases. What is less mm -hmm. clear is the fact that sometimes uh, for unclaimed species, we have no idea at all of how do this biochemical system, the system based on biochemical uh, characteristics, perform, which means that sometimes we will end up with bad ID, but we will, we will have no uh, way or information or if, if we do not perform some other additional uh, classical uh, characterization, like coloration, like uh, simple uh, enzymatic testing, to, f to figure out that the system end up with a bad ID. So it's difficult. We know this is one of the uh, drawbacks of this system, that uh, it's very difficult that sometimes if it is an isolate that corresponds to a species not claimed in the database, the system can falsely identified to something that is in the database, and it is very difficult to figure out uh, this point. So things are now improving, and uh, we can expect better reliability, that's clear. But I would say that for our experience, because we did some evaluation of some uh, biochemical uh, system, they did perform very, very well for some uh, of the very common species we faced in the lab, so we can still uh, be confident for, for, for some routine application. Well, thank That's you very my much. Point of view. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. If your question was not answered during this presentation, it will be addressed via email. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions, our speaker for their presentations, and our sponsor, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories, for making today's educational webcast a valuable experience. This webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 2015. You'll receive an email from Pharmaceutical Technology alerting you when the webcast will be available for replay. Please invite your colleagues who may have missed this live event by forwarding them the announcement. Thank you again for attending today's webcast, Developing a Comprehensive Toolkit for Microbial Identification. Have a good day.